All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our presentation on facing audit phobia, where we'll be providing tips and strategies on how to have a successful and pain-free audit. Um, for those of you who are not closely familiar with McClinic and Associates, um, first, yes, it is pronounced McClinic, not McClintock. Um, but we're a CPA firm located just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, but we do audit work and uh, consulting work for schools all across the country. And we've been doing so for um, nearly 50 years. My name is Lou Coy, um, and I've been a part of M&A for uh, almost 10 of those years. My co-presenters today are Kathy Demchak and Parker Charlton. Um, we're part of the firm's audit practice, and the three of us focus specifically on Title IV compliance. Prior to joining m and each of us worked at various institutions of higher ed in the Pittsburgh area. Parker and Kathy both held leadership positions at their schools, um, so they have experienced Title IV compliance audits as both the auditor and the auditee. <clears throat> okay, so you're all here because you want information, which is perfect because this presentation and the accompanying discussion are provided for informational purposes only. Um, and I should never try to do uh, Zoom jokes because it, there's never uh, a reaction, um, but I can't help myself and it wasn't even that, that good of a joke. Um, but we do want to remind schools that uh, we'll be speaking generally on this topic um, for matters that are specific to your institution, we recommend that you seek individualized legal counsel or accounting advice as appropriate. And uh, contents in this presentation should not be redistributed or republished without consent. Here's our agenda for today. We'll start off by talking about the latest audit trends uh, and how recent regulatory changes could impact your audit coming up. Um, we'll give you advice on electronic audits uh, where your auditor is completing their work remotely rather than on site at your school. And finally, we'll talk through how to view your audit as a learning opportunity uh, as opposed to maybe a necessary evil. We'll be fielding questions throughout and would encourage you to participate in the discussion by submitting a question in the chat. Uh, we're going to actually start with a little word association exercise. Um, if you have a pen and paper handy, I'd like you to go ahead and write down a word or a couple of words that come to mind when you hear the term audit. I'm going to give everybody a minute to do that now. And by a minute, I mean like 10 seconds. What words come to mind when you hear the term audit? Okay. We understand that the word audit has a negative connotation for many people. Um, we're not going to pretend that it doesn't, um, but I think that that may be because, at least for the general public, they would probably associate the term audit with an IRS audit. Um, and for that, it comes out of nowhere. You might feel like you did something wrong that you're going to get in trouble, and that certainly makes sense. The question is why then for schools, uh, in this case, are, is there still anxiety and fear around annual recurring audits when you know it's coming? Um, in preparing for this presentation and we're kind of reflecting on that question, I came to the conclusion that I think um, the financial aid profession tends to attract perfectionists and maybe control freaks uh, a little bit. And I can admit that I have some of those tendencies myself. Um, and while those types of individuals may produce um, top quality work consistently, um, the drive to be right or to feel sure, 100% uh, sure about things is often rooted in fear. Um, whether it's fear of failure, fear of being wrong, fear of skinny guys with glasses and thinning hair, could be any number of those things, but um, 
I think a lot of the anxiety around <clears throat> audits is just not wanting to um, mess up. And I have, in my experience, I've you know I've conducted many uh, interviews, exit interviews with financial aid directors over the years, and in many cases, their audit results yielded um, very few findings, a um, couple here and there, nothing significant or, um, or widespread. And so uh, in those meetings, though, I've, it's been apparent that the, <clears throat> the person I'm meeting with is, is really discouraged and maybe beating themselves up about it um, a little bit. And no matter how much I try to reassure them that, no, this is actually fairly good results, um, considering everything that comes along with administering Title IV aid, um, whatever voice it is that's inside their head and whatever that voice is telling them is um, it's louder and it's more convincing than, than my voice. And so I think that um, if that is true, if that feels true to you, um, then that could be part of what what's causing anxiety and fear. Now, that's not the only reason, of course, um, there's an unknown of how, when your audit report is submitted, how the Department of Ed will respond to that, and that's another side of things. Um, but that part of it is really outside of your control, what you can control. And what we would give as our number one tip for facing your audit phobia <clears throat> would be to um, train your mind to view it as a, an, a learning opportunity. Um, and the reason that educate is the biggest word on this slide is that would be the best way, the best lens to um, view the audit through. Um, so a good auditor, and really for us, it's, it's the biggest emphasis for us as well. Of course, we have a job to do. Our job is to find things that you did incorrectly. Um, but if we're doing that without also educating you, then um, we're not doing our job properly. And um, those errors are likely to repeat themselves if you really haven't learned from those mistakes. Um, and it's important, I think, also uh, for me personally, my best experiences um, are when I uh, have an audit that I've done in the prior year and then for the current year, see that the school has implemented a recommendation that we gave. Um, it gives us uh, a sense of um, that we are helping in the process as well. Um, so yes, mindset is very important, uh, but also important is kind of knowing what to expect, knowing your stuff. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Parker to talk through some of the latest audit trends. Thanks so much, Luke. I really appreciate it. And uh, as Luke mentioned, I have a set on both sides, uh, being the auditee and the auditor. And I, I get the uh, fear and all, all the other words you had on your slide there, Luke, that, that can come with being the audit. So, you know, our hope today is really to help provide you uh, with some different tools to help you not have that fear. And one of those tools is, like Luke mentioned, knowing what's going on and what the latest audit trends are. Um, so we're going to talk quite a bit, not quite a bit, we're going to talk briefly, I should say, on all of these different topics today. Um, I will say that we're probably going to start with what I consider to be some uh, great news we've received from the department over the last year or so with some outgoing requirements. Then we'll touch on the other items. Some are Good news, some are flexibilities, some are uh, challenges. So we'll discuss all the whole range of items here. Um, again, if you have any questions during this segment, please do send them in through the chat. Um, Kim is monitoring the chat for us and she'll let us know when we have questions and have a different time to answer them. So with that, we'll jump right in to the outgoing requirements. And there are a whole slew of them. Um, like I mentioned, I think this might be the best part of the presentation, uh, not only because I present it, but because it's less work for each of us uh, and more opportunity for students, uh, which is probably the most important thing. So our first bullet point here, we talk about SULA. Uh, as of July 1st, 2021, uh, the SULA regulations are no more. Um, if you wanna cheer on that, 
feel free. Uh, we certainly did here in the office when that came out. A couple points with this though, please uh, do remember that you still must update loan periods. Um, if borrower's actual attendance is different from the original date submitted to COD. Um, so even though SUA is gone, we do have to make those updates still. Selective service uh, C codes have gone away as well. Oh, I shouldn't say they've gone away. They no longer have the power they once had. Uh, since select require, registering for selective service is no longer a requirement in order to receive Title IV funding. However, the C codes will still populate, but they can be ignored. Um, also, as of July 1st, 2021, the drug-related convictions C codes um, no longer have the authority they once did. That question does remain on the ICER or on the FAFSA, um, and C codes will still populate, but again, they can be ignored. For verification, for V1, I should say, for the 21-22 and now the 22-23 year, the V1 requirement has been waived, um, which is another huge piece and I think uh, uh, something schools are celebrating. Um, please do remember, though, that conflicting information still needs to be resolved. So if you were in the midst of collecting verification documentation from a student and you have some of that paperwork, you do need to compare it to the ICER information to make sure that there is no conflicting information. If there is conflicting information, it does have to be resolved. We've seen this bite a couple uh, clients uh, who didn't follow the process all the way through. Also for 22-23 verification, uh, the high school completion requirement for V4 and V5 is going away. Um, schools must still have a process though to evaluate and validate a student's high school diploma or proof of graduation. If there's a reason to believe the diploma is not valid, the school must investigate this further. The final piece here is the annual student loan acknowledgement. Um, I think this process caused most financial aid professionals a lot of heartburn over the last couple of years, and it's been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. Um, and finally, we received word that it will not be in place for tw the 22-23 award year, and it will not be in place in the future at this point. Um, the process uh, remains available for students out there on the studentaid.gov website, however, um, but it's nothing that you as a school administrator are required to have a student complete. Um, so that's a whole slew of outgoing requirements that I think are definitely working in our favor here. We're going to go ahead and move on over. Hey, Parker. To... Yeah. I, you know, I, I was going to pose a question myself um, on this, the last slide, but it, it looks like we have a couple of questions that have come through the chat that are related to the outgoing requirements. Um, the question I was going to pose, and actually wasn't a question so much as a, a recommendation, was regarding SULA. Um, for our, yeah, that's, the, that's, that's sorry, good I'm really going to move that. Um, so obviously, yeah, it, it was rescinded, meaning that it's no longer limiting students' eligibility for subsidized loans for any loan period where the first disbursement will be dispersed after July 1st. Um, in our audits for fiscal year 2021, uh, on a couple of occasions, I saw cases where a loan period began after July 1st. Uh, and subsidized loan money was withheld because the school's student system um, was still factoring that in as an eligibility criteria for subs. So my recommendation would simply be to, if you can pull reporting out of your system to identify loan period dates uh, and then assess uh, if there are students who didn't get sub and ensure that it wasn't because of the 150% limit, but maybe they didn't have need or they've already reached the aggregate limit of 23,000, but that would be my recommendation. And the, the questions um, we're seeing from Robin that uh, they're getting ICERs for current students with comments 25 or 27, um, and not sure why that would be if SULA doesn't apply anymore. 25 or 20, is it 265 or 267? I'm not sure offhand what the comment numbers are, but I'm not sure why that would be, assuming you're talking about a 22, 23 ICER. Um, Parker, Kathy, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I mean, if it was the 21, 22 ICER, I know we were still seeing 
Sorry, I'm seeing her response come in. And for 2122, the, the C codes are still out there um, simply because the NSODS and COD information is still being gathered. Um, I thought Ed had said that the C codes would begin to go away in the 22, 23 year, but I can't be 100% sure on that. Um, what I can say is that any, any C codes involving SULA should not be impacting a student's eligibility for subsidized funding. Okay. Thanks for posing that question, Robin. And uh, if we didn't really hit on what you were talking about, feel free to contact us directly. Um, and then a clarification item, Parker. Um, yeah, I see that there from Bertha. Yeah. Uh, so what, let me be clear on that. Um, V4 and V5 are still required for the 22-23 year. Uh, the piece that is not required is the high school completion. Uh, you do not have to get proof of high school completion for those students. Um, you do still need to complete all the other steps with V4 and V5. So, um, you know, your the statement of educational purpose, uh, proof of ID, all of those pieces are still required. Um, V1 is waived for the 22-23 year. Okay. Good questions. Please keep them coming, though. Um, next up, we'll discuss SAP flexibility a little bit. Um, so PACE is no longer uh, needed to be part of your SAP policy uh, for subscription-based programs, non-term programs, and clock hour programs. I think this makes sense to anybody who has those programs as you need to be passing your classes in order to receive additional aid. So the PACE component's already built into that. So this was a pretty logical move by the Department of Education. Um, maximum time frame for credit hour programs uh, can now be calculated based on the calendar time. Um, schools can still choose to use uh, credit hours. And I would recommend that whichever method you choose to use, you have to use for all students in that same program. So you can use calendar hours for one program, clock hours for another, um, but they need to be within a program, they have to have the same methodology. We haven't seen any of our clients as of yet move over to calendar time. Um, the examples we've looked at from the Department of Education and through some other uh, resources, it does appear that the calendar time would be a more strict SAP requirement. Um, I'm guessing that's why we haven't seen anybody move to it yet. Um, if you are interested in moving to it, though, we're pretty well versed in it. We can help you out with that. Our next piece here is going to be clock to credit conversion. Um, I think this is personally, I think this is great news uh, as anybody who's had to work their way through the prior five step process uh, in clock to credit conversion. I know many people thought it was just as simple as dividing by 37 and a half or 25 and a half, but it wasn't quite that simple. Um, so this, this move should simplify pieces for us, but there is maybe a piece of work or two to do right up at the beginning of this. Um, so uh, semester or trimester hours uh, to determine your clock to credit conversion. Now you'll simply divide the total clock hours in classroom hours by 30. Uh, for quarter programs, you'll divide the total classroom hours by 20. So outside hours and homework will no longer be factored into the conversion. Uh, the new conversion should not result in a reduction of hours for any programs uh, based on the old five-step process and the new one, there shouldn't be any reduction in hours. Um, however, if the new conversion results in an increase in hours, uh, you do need to update your program information on your e-app, um, and you should have done that already, but if you haven't yet, you need to do it immediately. Um, and please remember that regardless of the conversion, a class cannot have more financial aid hours than academic hours. This is something we see uh, somewhat regularly from schools, um, you know, is, and I just give you the example. If your accreditor says a class is only worth uh, three academic hours and your conversion formula comes out to five financial aid hours, that doesn't make a difference. It can still only be worth the maximum of the academic hours there. 
we'll keep moving along here with uh, what is my favorite and least favorite topic, uh, which is Arch T4 uh, exemptions. And then after this slide, we'll also talk about uh, some changes in the Arch T4 calculation itself. Um, we've given presentations in the past specifically on the Arch T4 exemptions and the Arch T4 uh, denominator changes. So if you're looking for uh, detailed information on that, I'd recommend you go out to our website. Uh, you can take a look at the information we have out there. Um, you can also contact us with any specific questions. This presentation um, is really not meant to be a deep dive into these topics. Um, we're just going to touch on them briefly and talk more about uh, some of the issues that we've seen clients have around these topics in recent audits. So the graduation exemption, just a reminder, a student is not considered a withdrawal. Um, if, if the student completes all requirements for graduation before completing the days or hours in the period. Um, I would just remind you also that aid recalculation rules will apply to specifically to this exemption. Um, the written confirmation exemption, uh, it, for non-term or subscription, the student provides you written confirmation at the time of their, their leaving and they're going to return within 60 calendar days from ceasing attendance, that they do not need to be considered a withdrawal. On the term side, if at the time of their dropping or, or leaving class, uh, they provide you with written confirmation that they'll return within 45 calendar days, and that is still within the same pe uh, period, then the student is not considered a withdrawal. The two big ones here, uh, at least in my opinion, the halftime exemption, the student has to successfully complete Title IV coursework equal to or greater than the school's definition of halftime. Um, and remember, this will only apply to a modular-based program. And the same thing with the 49% exemption. If a student successfully completes Title IV eligible coursework in one or more modules that include 49% of the countable days for the period, then they're not considered an exemption either. So with all of these new pieces going into play, um, some of the issues that we've seen around this is first that schools are not identifying uh, that a student met an ArchT4 exemption. There are a couple of tools out there. Uh, we at MA have put out an, a decision tree on this. I know NASPA has put out something somewhat similar as well. Um, the other piece I would just say is that if any of these sound strange to you or you're not familiar with them and you have especially if you have modular based programs this is kind of your warning that you may be missing something so you know, reach out to us um, reach out to you know whoever you get your regulatory guidance from because there's a piece that might be missing for you for those people who are identifying their t4 exemptions a big piece that's coming into play is uh, nsods enrollment reporting so uh, specifically, really it applies for anybody who meets one of these exemptions. But where we've seen issues is with the halftime exemption and the 49% exemption. If a student meets one of those exemptions and is not returning or does not return for their next payment period or next term, that student's withdrawal date within NSODS, the date you're reporting as the withdrawal, should not be their LDA but it should be the last date of the term that they receive the exemption in. Um, the reason for this is because the Department of Education considers that student to have completed the term. So if, uh, if your report, I know that's tough for everybody. We're used to when a student withdraws to simply report their LDA um, as the last date of attendance, but that, that isn't the case with this. We have to report the last date of the term. Another piece we've seen some schools have issues with is the recalculation of Pell that's required when a student meets most of these exemptions. So again, I'll use the halftime exemption as an example here. If a student met the halftime exemption for you, but was originally scheduled for full time, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to have to recalculate that student's Pell. Um, so while you're not doing an ArchT4 calculation here, you do still have to adjust the Pell if the student received Pell at a higher enrollment level than what they actually completed. The final piece that we see, we've seen a few instances or issues on has to do with credit balance. 
Um, a credit, a Title IV credit balance does need to be resolved within 14 days of its creation if the student hasn't authorized the school to hold those funds. This can be a little bit different um, because you, you do get a little extra time when a student drops in most cases because you start to base things off of the DOD and RTT4 date. But when they meet an exemption, everything is based off the date that Title IV credit balance was created. So uh, you do need to make sure that it's being resolved timely there. Luke, I saw some things going on in the questions. Is there anything you think we should stop for here? I don't, and I, I regret my timing just because what you've just covered is really important. I didn't want to distract people um, with providing a link, but no, I, I was able to find um, more information about the comments 25, 27 that Robin had mentioned in her question. Um, and there, the details are in that electronic announcement that's linked in the chat if anybody is curious. But Parker, another question has popped up um, sure. regarding Pell recalculations. Let me read it for you and then I'll give you a minute Thank to you. think through it. So Kim is asking, is that Pell recalc based on completed or attempted, meaning if they complete nine credits based on clock to credit conversion, but they attempted 18, based on clock to credit, would we do the recalc or no because they attempted full-time credits? So Pell is going to be based on the attempted, okay? But it, let's be clear that in order to have attempted a credit, you had to have had attendance in that class. So, you know, it, just because they were scheduled for that class doesn't make it attempted. They have to actually have participated or, or been in that class for at least one day. That's a very good question though. We'll continue forward here with the R2T4 piece. Um, and let's talk about um, total days scheduled to attend. So what we're really talking about here is the denominator portion of your actual R2T4 calculation. So uh, everything that we talked about with the exemptions goes out the window because none of the students that we're gonna talk about now met an exemption. That's why they're having an RT4 calculation. Um, this is a pretty major change. Uh, it impacts the percentage of aid a students earned. Um, and schools now have two options. Uh, and again, we're talking for modular based programs in particular here. Uh, two options, you know, we get two options to use. You can either choose to use an RT4 free state or to not use an RT4 free state. If you choose to use the RT4 freeze date, um, you get to pick the actual day. Uh, you do have to have a policy regarding which day your RT4 freeze date will be. Um, and you can choose multiple RT4 freeze dates within a particular term. Uh, the schools would use the student's enrollment schedule as of the RT4 freeze date to determine the total days scheduled to attend for the RT4. The total day scheduled to attend would also include all classes a student has attendance in, regardless if that class was added after the Arch T4 freeze date. A school that chooses not to use the Arch T4 freeze date is going to base the total days scheduled on the student's type of aid and the student's schedule for the payment period or period of enrollment. Um, there's a lot of nuances with schools that choose not to use the Arch T4 freeze date, in particular, the type of aid. So if a student's receiving direct loans or SEOG, that's going to change the number of days in the Arch T4 calculation versus if the student's just using the Pell, Pell grant. Ed updated guidance uh, met several, three, four times uh, after the regulations went live on July 1st of 21. Uh, all the updated guidance can be found on the Program Integrity Q&A website, and I'll put that link in the chat once my section's done here. Um, the guidance, the last guidance was updated on October 5th and then again on November 24th, but it's essentially the same guidance. Um, so the good news is, is that you can choose to use the guidance that was updated on 1025 and, and then updated slightly on 1124 for any RT4 that occurred from 7121 or later for a modular based program. Um, if you have specific questions about 
uh, an ARCH-T4 without a freeze date, um, please go ahead and reach out to us. We'd be happy to help you on those. And again, we've done some uh, specific presentations just on that information uh, that we can help direct you to as well. From an audit perspective, um, these regulations have provided a series of challenges. Um, the most concerning is that you know, we as auditors need to determine when a student was scheduled for classes, as this can impact both schools using the ArchT4 freeze date and those choosing not to use the ArchT4 freeze date. This wasn't something we had to worry about before is when a schedule changed very often. Um, for schools that are using an ArchT4 freeze date, our recommendation is making a record of all the student schedules, at, I'm sorry, of the student schedule as of the ArchT4 freeze date. Uh, this can be used when completing the ARCH T4 calculation and provided to your auditor. For schools that are not using the ARCH T4 freeze date, um, we'd recommend printing a copy of the student's schedule at the date of the termination. Uh, this will help uh, the person processing the ARCH T4 as long as be important information as us as the auditor. Um, even with this information, though, we may need to research further when classes were added or dropped. Um, from you know from the student schedule so this could involve some additional access for the school if you provide your sis at, uh, if you provide sis access to your auditor you may need to help them find where this information can be housed um, and again we may need to work with somebody like your registrar or something another department like that to get the information that's needed to assure that the arch t4 calculation was done correctly that's an awful lot about ArchT4 changes. Um, let's touch on just a few more subjects real quick, and then then you can stop listening to me and listen to uh, Luke. Or I'm sorry, Kathy. Um, the next piece that we did see, we've gotten quite a bit of guidance in recently from the Department of Education and the OIG has been professional judgments. You can see the timeline listed there on the screen. You know, in April of 2020. Ed encouraged more professional judgments as a response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. In January of 21, they continued that um, and let us know that you know, it wouldn't be a determining factor in program reviews for the 21-22 year. Then in December of 21, the OIG announced that, it can, uh, that they're gonna have a continued focus on professional judgment decisions from schools. So I don't know about you guys, but this feels a little contradictory to me. It feels like Ed wants us to be using professional judgments more to help students, but the OIG is very concerned about us as a, 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 a school system or a, as, as higher education in using so many professional judgments. Um, our stance here at MA is that you know, professional judgments will be a point of emphasis uh, moving forward by the Department of Education and the OIG. Um, we have two very specific recommendations for professional judgments. Um, and the very first one is that you take a look at your policies and procedures around professional judgments. Um, we recommend you re review them in your current form um, and make sure they're meeting at least the minimum regulations. Also, you would need to be making sure that your, your process is actually following your policy uh, that you have written out there for professional judgments. The second recommendation is to over-document your reasoning behind all of your professional judgment decisions. Um, PJs must be done on a student-by-student -student basis, so all documentation for professional judgment should be specific to that student. Um, just a reminder, you cannot apply a PJ to an entire cohort of students. So even though there's probably going to be some additional emphasis on professional judgments uh, moving forward, we don't believe this should really cause an increase in findings or issues for you, as long as your policies and procedures are uh, accurate and substantial and you're following those. Uh, and it's really supporting your decisions with uh, the correct amount of documentation. The final piece I have for you today has to do with 22-23 power changes. So Ed first published the 22-23 Pell chart back at the end of January of this year. Then the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 22 took place and that uh, increased the Pell Grant amount. Um, it also increased the maximum EFC elig eligible for the Pell Grant. Ed published uh, 
updated award charts for us on, on a Dear Colleague letter on March 24th of this year. Um, and schools must be using the revised charts when determining 22-23 Pell proceeds. COD has now been updated with the revised Pell information as of May 1st. Um, and just a reminder that the CPS will reprocess 22-23 ICERs uh, with an EFC that was between 5846 and 6206, so the range where the maximum EFC uh, increased. Um, and those were reprocessed on 524 of this year. So if you got a whole slew of ICERs on that day, that'd be why, because Ed was reprocessing them for you. And they updated those ICERs with the correct Pell eligibility. So just a reminder to please make sure you're using the correct 22-23 Pell charts. Kim or Luke, were there any questions that we didn't get to? Um, not that I can see. Parker, I think we're on top of it. And Kim did post a link to the uh, program integrity Q&A that you referenced a few slides back related to the R2T4 exemptions. Okay, great. Thank well, you, with Kim. that, thank you guys so much. And I'll turn it back over. Thanks, Parker. Yeah. So, yeah, turning it back to me, Kathy will have to sit and wait <laughs> for her turn a little bit longer. But... Um, I will, uh, I will try to get through this section here efficiently. Um, Luke, we do have a question. What I'm going to be talking about is uh, from Eddie. Do you audits. expect the Graham Leach Bliley requirement that, that goes uh, into effect in December 22 audits in a more to be part of the SFA audit is, for FY? It's already becoming a trend prior to uh, the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which made sense because uh, a lot of schools were converting their paper files into electronic formats. And when thinking about, um, you know, traveling out to your school just to sit in a conference room and be on our computers, it didn't uh, make a ton of sense to continue doing audits that way. And so, like I said, even before um, March of 2019, we had started to do more and more of our audit field work um, from our office here in Pittsburgh. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the uh, pros and cons of doing the audit that way. Um, there wasn't much of a choice, uh, again, since uh, March of 2019 to today, but we are starting to do more traveling uh, for the clients that, that prefer us to be on site. Uh, so here's just a list of some of the good things about an e-audit and some of the uh, difficulties. In terms of pros, uh, the first is, um, I think, pretty obvious, but uh, there's obviously a big cost difference when you think about um, bringing a team of auditors out to your school for up to a week um, and you know, paying for their flights, their lodging, the food, et cetera. It can be thousands of dollars depending on the size of the audit team and the, the size of the audit. Um, and so that's certainly significant and the school you know, saves money by um, opting for the remote audit. It also provides for more <clears throat> flexibility um, where when we are on site, we're all up in your business, um, literally, and uh, you might, might not be great timing <clears throat> when we come to your office for, <clears throat> excuse me, a question where we send it to you um, by email or another way. Um, you have the ability to prioritize your schedule with what makes the most sense for you. Um, and so that is a benefit. Um, and similarly for us, you know, we like the, we like not having to travel, being away from home. Um, it also allows us to replace that time spent traveling with doing you know, what we feel like is more productive work, work on the audits. So it is mutually beneficial in those ways. Uh, the last pro I have listed is that it's, it's potentially less administrative burden, and that's depending on how files are provided to us, which I'll talk more about on a, my next slide. Uh, the, the cons, um, communication is more difficult when you're limited to phone and email. Um, I wish I would have bought stock in Zoom uh, in early 2019, um, but which is great, you know, having video, the ability to call, but also see the person was, um, it is 
very helpful, I think, with the process in making communication better. Um, but it, even that is still uh, just more difficult, where, like I said, when we are on site, uh, focused on you, you are focused on us because we're there, um, the communication is much more efficient and clear. Sometimes it's, it's difficult to interpret tone when it's, uh, you know, maybe a written email or a shared document typing back and forth. Um, the counterbalance to uh, the, the flexibility is that there's there's less accountability, really. Um, out of sight, out of mind, when we're not there, um, like I said, you, you have the ability to prioritize your schedule, but if you make the audit questions less of a priority, um, then your audit is going to feel a lot longer than it than it needs to. It'll stretch have it'll it'll stretch out uh, into over multiple weeks versus having the the team come in in person and get it done and and then when they leave being pretty much done with the the entire process. Um, and then finally, um, as I mentioned already, uh, Zoom calls are great. It's nice to be able to see people, but you can't replace face-to-face um, -face and person-to-person -person time. And I've really uh, felt that as I've started to go back more uh, to conferences and, and traveling there. Um, we like the people that we work with, and it's, it's nice to be able to build the relationship more um, in person when, um, when doing, when working together. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, it's potentially less administratively burdensome, and Parker even alluded to the fact that schools uh, will sometimes give us, set us up with access to their student information system or financial aid management system. It's beneficial because um, it saves time in having to scan in or print out uh, lots of files, paper. Um, it's efficient in that we as the auditor are able to go and retrieve information <clears throat> for ourselves versus relying on you to, to get everything for us. Um, there are many of us at McClinic and Associates who come from schools and therefore have uh, experience with using some of the more prominent student information systems that are out there. And so we have familiarity with not only where things are, but what are the reporting functionalities in those systems and can use that to our advantage by conducting some of the testing uh, more at a, a macro level than a student by student level, where we can tell, pull certain reports to tell that uh, certain information is being provided like exit counseling and um, loan disbursement notifications. Uh, it's and as a result, we get it done more quickly and are probably more accurate with it versus coming through each individual file when you're looking at 100 plus students. Um, finally, and related to that, uh, since we do have expertise in a lot of those systems, um, it's an opportunity for us to advise you on um, you know, more functionalities of your system, better ways to pull reports and uh, to save you time uh, as well. Now, I realize that some of you might, some of your, um, perhaps some audit phobia is flaring up <laughs> for you right now when talking about um, getting your auditor uh, access to your system. Um, so I want to address that uh, now. And just, um, first of all, when we talk about access to the student information system, it might have gone without saying, but it would be read-only access that we would have so that we could see the, the information, not change anything. We wouldn't want to change anything. If it happened, it would happen by accident. But um, your IT department, hopefully you uh, have one or at least a person who can handle that. But um, yeah, so the, the access would be read-only. Um, and I understand um, being hesitant to give access to every single uh, item within the system. Uh, however, I can assure you that the audit do process not. is already time consuming enough and that um, we're asking, we'd be asking for that simply as a matter of efficiency, not to do anything additional than we would uh, otherwise. So it just save you, save us from having to ask you more questions. Um, and so when we get access set up and if, if it is 
maybe more limited access, if you can think about it from our perspective, um, it does, you know, raise suspicion that, you know, the school would potentially be trying to to hide something from us. Um, so, best the best course and what we recommend is just opening the book, um, and we can do our work, and that's the quickest way to do it, and and you'll get the best out of it too, because if we are able to see more, we're able to provide more uh, feedback to you, recommendations. The last point I'll um, talk a little bit more about on this slide, and that's just making sure it's critical to protect this information that you are providing to us because a lot of it provides sense or includes sensitive information. Um, one of the more recent additions to the audit guide is uh, a compliance check on um, schools' uh, requirement or compliance with uh, the Graham Leach Bliley Act. And so we ask for a school's information security program and ensure that it has certain criteria included. And it's probably similar to when we review an annual security report, there are certain um, policy statements that are necessary within that document that we are being that we are looking for. Um, we're not criminal justice experts, nor are we IT security experts. And so for us, we are you know, looking at it from uh, strictly, uh, here's what it needs to say, perspective versus if I can, I, I, I'm, I would speculate that this, uh, in addition to, you know, professional judgments is, is going to be something that's an emphasis for the Department of Ed moving forward. Um, and so you'll want to make sure your ducks are in a row on that end. Um, and, yeah, uh, the last point here is uh, there are many ways to ensure that the files that have personally identifiable information are protected. Mentioned if we do get remote access to the system, to your student information system, that can be um, done through VPN access, remote desktops. Um, I think about COD when I read the two-step verification. I think it's like five or six step verification. Uh, every time I watch somebody log on, it's always, I'm always amazed at how long it takes. Um, but it's good. Uh, this is becoming more and more important as everything becomes more and more digitalized. Uh, and a, a couple of final comments on communication. Um, yeah, I, emails and, call, and phone calls are, uh, are, are limited. So whenever possible, we do like to you know, do Zoom calls or Microsoft Teams uh, to compensate for some of that, uh, you know, disconnect that you experience by just talking to us rather than seeing us. Um, and I think it's really important to ensure that you and your auditor have the same expectations regarding communication. Um, and so what works well is that if, you, if there's a time period of time where you agree you're going to both be working on the project. You can set up a shared document, type in questions, you can put in responses, and we can see them in live time. We find that that's a very efficient way to communicate and also a secure way uh, if it's a shared document that requires you know, a, a unique password or link. Uh, and then you want to make sure that you understand what, what their expectation is and what your expectation is regarding the frequency of your communication. You know, when we're on site at a school, we're seeing you every day. And so kind of touching base where if you prefer to have more communication, you should let your auditor know that. Um, but if you're having daily status updates that you feel like you don't really need, um, you should let them know that too, because certainly they, they don't want to waste your time. Um, and that uh, is my last point here. I just, yeah, thanks, Kim. Potentially, potentially. <laughs> I 50 50, Eddie, in my opinion. It's, I think the audit guide is, we know that it's not updated very frequently, but if it's one new rule, um, it's an easier thing than to do a, an entire makeover of the, of the guide. And so, 
I wouldn't be surprised. And whether it's in the audit guide or not, uh, it's something that um, needs to be taken very seriously um, across the board. Parker, Kathy, do you have other thoughts on that item? Yeah, I think I think we've had some communication with the OIG that they are looking at the audit guide in general. Um, so I think whether it's in 2022 or fiscal year 2022 or fiscal year 2023, I think we're going to see something come out, whether it be in a dear colleague letter um, or something from the OIG about updating some requirements around the GLBA. It's, it's a very uh, prominent piece that Department of Ed and OIG are focused on at this point. So I would expect that we'll see something come out about it. Yeah, I, I agree because um, they are making some changes, uh, mainly because of ransomware and um, schools being a big target for that because of all the you know data that you have. So there will, whether it's part of our review um, for audits that would end December 31st this year, um, for next year, we'll have to see, but it's definitely something you should be thinking about updating and getting everyone on your campus who has a part in that together to update your policy. Yeah, and now that I've well, had a little bit more time to kind of think through it, I, I kind of, I'm, I'd be more doubtful that it would be part of your FY 2022 audit. I think that the earliest we'd see it go into the audit guide would be July 1 of next year. Um, in conversations with the OIG, they've, as I mentioned, I, I referenced the audit guide and I was um, referring to the proprietary school audit guide where for single audits, the the OIG is actually required to produce a compliance supplement and update it annually. So that is more of a accurate uh, reflection on what it is exactly that they want auditors to be looking at. So chances are, if it pops up in the compliance supplement, um, then it's likely going to make its way to the proprietary school audit guide. Um, so that's just uh, some additional uh, information on that. But yeah, we have just a little bit of time left, so I want to make sure we get to Kathy's uh, section here. So I'll turn it over to you, Kathy. Okay, thanks, Luke. Um, so we're going to talk about something a little more enlightening um, and talk about some positive outcomes of a compliance audit or program review and how you can turn something you may see as a negative outcome into a positive one. So I know audits and program reviews can create a lot of anxiety but if you look at them as an opportunity to learn, you will see them as a helpful tool in your compliance toolbox. So let's say you get through your audit with no findings. That is great. Keep up to date on new regulations and stay the course. But maybe you have a few findings and we see these as opportunities to tweak processes and learn to do things better. So let's say your auditor finds a process that's not meeting the current regulatory standards. What do you do? First thing is you want to review your processes. You know, are they working? Are changes needed to improve any processes? Are there other offices with whom you need to collaborate with? So maybe the registrar for enrollment reporting or student accounts for credit balances, um, academic departments or advisors for SAP related data or admissions for high school completion documentation. Many of the processes that are completed in the financial aid office are dependent on information from other campus offices. So your next step should be to update your policy and procedures manual. Identify processes that need to be changed and implemented. Think ahead, what are the consequences of the change? Are there inefficiencies and what are the outcomes? Do these changes make you susceptible to the top audit and program review findings? The 2021 uh, FSA virtual conference has a breakout session number 13 in which Effie Barnett went through the top audit and program review findings and gave some great ideas on how you can make a plan to prevent your office from being at risk of one or more of them. So first, you want to create your policy and procedures or update them. 
You want to work together with staff that is close to the process to make those changes. And then you want to train your staff to understand the new changes. Is there anyone you need to provide training to in other campus offices like the registrar's office, student accounts, admissions, or advisors? And most importantly, you want to monitor the process, make sure your staff understands the process, and that the process is working in the way it was intended. So next, you want to make a timeline or an action plan to implement, implement any new processes or changes. Some questions to consider for changes to processes listed here might be, you know, how early should you begin the process, planning process? Um, who needs to be notified? What training might be needed? Where, will there be a testing period? Will there be a phased in implementation period? And what is the appropriate effective date for implementation of any new processes? Training is an administrative capability and a principle of internal control. Be sure to invest the time to train all staff members involved in the process. Ensure staff are properly trained and make sure they understand the impact of non-understanding and make sure they are aware of the timeline like days to complete a certain task. Make the policies and procedures available to staff. If you put it away in a file or electronically somewhere where no one can find it, it's not very useful. And always monitor the process. So select a process or two and perform your own internal audit. You can catch errors and have them corrected prior to your auditor finding them. Focus on processes that might have been a problem in the past, or if you have repeat findings, you should start with those. And remember, audits are opportunities to learn and, and improve. Be sure to ask your auditor questions while they're on site or during your audit. And remember that your auditor remains available after completion of the audit for any questions or concerns that you may have. So Kim, do we have any questions? Okay, the um, presentation is in the chat for you to download if you'd like to keep a copy of that. And Luke, do you have any closing comments? Um, since we have three minutes, I was going to take the opportunity <laughs> to ask my own questions again, this time of, of YouTube. Um, you have, as I mentioned, the front, um, you know, you were you were involved in the audit process at the schools that you worked at. And I'm just curious if you were to write down like the exercise that we did of writing down a word or words that come to mind. Um, at that point in your career, I guess, what what would you have, what was your impression of the audit process? I guess maybe if you want to add, what have you learned since um, joining the dark side here? <laughs> First of all, I don't think it's the dark side. Agreed. Um, I, you know, I feel that, you know, working in a school and being behind, on that side of the desk, that we are more of partners with our clients because we understand what they're going through. Um, for me, my phobia, my fear was errors. You know, no, you know, you try to do everything right all year long and then it comes to that time for your audit and you just cross your fingers and hope that you did everything right and you didn't miss anything. So I think too that after the audit, my word would be comfort because you either came through it very well and had no findings or you came through it and you found that area or areas where you needed to make changes and you know now that everything else was correct and those are the areas that you need to focus on. Yeah, I don't think I can say my words that <laughs> I had when I came up around and on it. Um, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, it, it was definitely scary, you know, and, and I think for Luke and Kathy, the, the reasons you pointed out, you know, you put all this effort in over a year um, to and to handle students and and look, we understand we we've been on that side of the desk as Kathy said, you know, we know that your daily task isn't to be in compliance. Your daily task is to help students, and compliance is just a portion of that. So you know, we don't expect uh, financial aid officers, or financial aid officers, or directors, or, or staff to be 100% focused on compliance. That's just not the way it goes. You know, it's more so the student who's walking into your office or calling you on the phone, 
and doing those things. That's where your, your focus lies. Um, so sometimes we get caught off guard by things because, you know, th you are focused on your students. Um, yeah, I think the thing I've learned from being on this side is that, you know, you can re you really can partner with your auditor. Um, there's a lot of knowledge that can be shared on both sides. You know, there are clients that I've asked questions to about how the processes they've had and, and because they're doing such a good job with it, what, what's making them successful. And, you know, it, it's always great when a client asks less questions and, and we're able to provide, you know, valuable information back, um, you know, whether it's to correct an issue they're having or to prevent an issue, which is even better. Um, so I, that'd be my takeaway is, you know, we want to partner with schools. Um, as Luke said, it is our job to look for errors. Um, but the satisfying part of our job is to help a school either prevent or correct those errors. Yeah, I agree, Parker. It's definitely a shared learning opportunity. Agree with you both. And thank you for adding those. Those are um, great, great closing points to make. And I um, want to just also close by thanking everybody who attended today. Um, feel free to reach out to Kathy Parker or anybody from m and um, with, with any further questions you might have. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.